Hello, my beautiful friends. I am Laurel Bleeden Maffei with Illuminating Souls, welcoming you to this episode of Sleepy Bedtime Blessings, a podcast designed to help you rest, relax, and fall asleep, all while deepening in your connection with your beautiful team of angels who love you so. I am an angelic practitioner, a spiritual teacher, and an encourager of souls. And I offer one-on-one angel sessions, soul mentoring, and a variety of classes designed to inspire your spirit. And you can learn more at my website, illuminatingsouls.com, where you can also sign up for my mailing list. There are actually two different places you can sign up for my lists. At the top of the page, you can sign up for my general mailing list, and you'll receive class announcements and other communications. And then further down on the home page, you can sign up for my daily inspiration email blast, and you will receive a daily inspirational email from me every weekday. And then I also publish regularly to my Facebook page. So lots of ways that we can connect. But for now, the angels and I are here to create a soothing, comforting, sweet space where you can replenish and receive love and be amused, (laughs) hopefully for the next hour or so. So I love sleep podcasts. I listen to one every night. There are quite a variety of them that I listen to, including this one. And I love the genre so much that I created this one to add my voice to the mixes of voices that can potentially help you navigate that bridge between waking life and the mystery of sleep. And that said, I do know that many of you listen during your waking hours as well. So whatever brings you here, I am grateful for this time with you. So when I first started this podcast a few years ago, my intention had been to publish twice a week, which was very ambitious, and I did that for several years. And over the past, I don't know, seven months or so, My energies have gone elsewhere, and so I'm trying to publish once a week, and I don't even always do that, and I don't want you to think for a moment it is because I no longer love this podcast. I absolutely do. It's just that I have so much energy in a day or in a week, and it's so interesting how my schedule shifted. In the past, I would teach classes typically on a Monday and on a Tuesday. And it's not that I wouldn't work on other days, but I had much more free time to work on other projects. But in a a wondrous way, I am teaching more than I have in a long time. I actually am facilitating classes four days a week now. So my spaciousness for other creative endeavors is not what it was before, but it will be coming back. And, you know, I always introduce this podcast by saying that I offer a variety of classes designed to inspire your spirit. And I don't know that I've shared with you what my classes are, and they're always changing, just so you know. So I will share with you about the classes I'm teaching now, just to give you a sense of what I do. And they're already underway, so this isn't me marketing them to you. But it'll give you a sense on what this work looks like. And again, my classes are always changing, so be sure to sign up for my list if any of these appeal to you. So on Monday mornings, I have the blessing of facilitating a wonderful group of heart-centered entrepreneurs. So these are other people who are coaches and healers, and authors, and inspirers, 
and it's a business mentoring group. And I bring forward a fairly unique approach to business development, which is to work very intuitively and tune in with the greater soul of your business and those that you have come here to serve. So it's a very liberating way to explore our businesses. And it's how I run Illuminating Souls and have for the entirety of its existence. So I have this beautiful group that has been meeting for over a year now in various capacities. And right now we are meeting under the banner of joy in business. And I love this group so much. So if you have a soul inspired business and you are seeking companionship and mentoring, that might be an option for you. We start a new cycle every six weeks. And then on Tuesdays, I'm facilitating a gloriously magical group for angel messenger training. So I had a group of five people go through the training and then they wanted to continue. So we're now in part two, which the angels are helping me create as we go. So that is lovely. And then on Wednesdays, I just started teaching my mid-journey class. This is an AI art program to help people use mid-journey to create visionary art. And we just started that. And then on Thursdays, I am co-facilitating a wonderful class with my friend Andrea Shear and how to create your own Oracle card deck. So I normally don't have this many classes going at once. I normally just offer one or two, but the angels sort of tapped me on the shoulder and said, we've got a lot for you to bring into the world. And so I'm really having so much fun. It is, it is such a great joy. And I love witnessing people come alive into their own gifts and their own wonder at what is possible through them. So that's a sampling of the classes I am facilitating right now. And all my classes take place over Zoom. And in the next month or two, I will have new classes coming up. I already have a sense on what those might be, but they're not finalized. So that's, that's where the week takes me. So I love recording these episodes with you and for you and my spaciousness and my schedule just hasn't been what it was. And I find that I have to, I don't have to, I choose to, as my husband would say, record these episodes early in the morning because it's when everything is quieter and it is easier to connect. So as I record this, it is a Saturday morning. It is just now 6 a.m. I've already been up for about an hour. It's still dark out and the world is quiet, at least right here. And so I share this quiet with you. And I share my gratitude with you for the opportunity to share this love with you. So let's see, what else can I share with you about this podcast? We'll be together for about an hour. Usually for the first 15 or 20 minutes, I ramble with you and I bring in the angels and share love with you. And then we move into story time and Story time can be a wide variety of things. It can be stories from my own life. I might go through the pages of an old community cookbook or TV guide or something that's in the public domain. And in this episode, I have a book that I'm going to read with you about one of my favorite things in the world, which is grocery stores. I know that might sound really weird, but it will make sense later. (laughs) But for now, for now, beautiful friends, the angels are here shining their love upon you and for you. So I want to invite you just to 
Take some nice deep breaths in, just allowing the angels to infuse your heart and the space you are in with beautiful love that is calibrated just for you. And I'm going to call the angels in. They're already here, but I love sharing this ritual with you. So beautiful angels on high, I invite you to join us here. And I ask that you infuse this broadcast with waves of love and goodness and healing and soothing, calming energies. Angels, I ask that you ripple this blessing wherever it is needed. The places that are known and unknown, seen and unseen, within our own lives and in the lives of those we love and beyond into the greater world. Angels, I ask that you help us center in the light of the divine and send these blessings to everyone who hears this message. And dear ones, just take some nice deep breaths in and just release, allowing yourself to be cleared of anything that does not belong to you. And just breathe. Allowing the light to flow to you now, allowing this love to flow to every cell of your body, every thought in your mind, and every emotion in your heart. And if you have prayers, intentions, requests that you would like to share with your angels and God, I invite you to bring them into your heart now in this amplified energy field where the love is flowing for you now. There's a lot transpiring in the world right now. And some of what is transpiring may be in your personal sphere. And if this is the case, May the angels hold you aloft and support you. Just know that you are loved. And there are prayers rippling in this world for you. And breathe, let's breathe. Allowing the light of God to meet you right where you are. It's one of the beautiful things I love about this work is we need not raise our energy to access the angels. The angels can shift their energy always to meet us where we are. I mean, yes, it is a lovely thing. I love raising my energy to access more of the angelic light, but always remember the angels can, will, and do meet you where you are. So just breathe, allowing this light to bathe you in love and blessings and sweetness and grace. As I speak these words, I feel such profound gratitude flowing through from the angels for you. They are so grateful that you are opening to this opportunity for them to support you. And you may ask them for any, anything at all, any help, any support, healing, clarity. And it's not like it's a genie in the bottle where all your wishes come true. But if you will think of it as vibrational support, that is, you share your prayers and ask for support, it creates more of an opportunity for the angels to flow through for you. So let's breathe together and call in the love and allow the blessings of light 
to reveal themselves to you over time. That you need not know all your answers right now. But that they are flowing to you. And so I invite you to cozy on up and snuggle on in. Especially if it is your bedtime. I love bedtime. I just bought new sheets for my husband and I and we put them on the bed and oh, they are lovely. <laughs> so I send you the vibration of clean sheet day and new sheet day in a bed that is perfectly made exactly the way you like it. Where it's easy for you to cozy up. And if this is your waking time, if you're going for your walk or driving or going about your day, then you can cozy up later. And for now, the angels and I will meet you wherever you are and shine this love upon you. So you rest. And while you rest, we're going to move on into story time. So as promised for story time, I have this very interesting little book to share with you. It is called The Old Grocery Man. And the author is Ro... Hold on, I'm vamping here because I can't read the last name. Hold on. Okay, by Ro Falkerson. But the thing that drew me to it is it was published by the Kellogg's Company in the early 1900s. So, so I am mesmerized by being able to read publications, magazines, newspapers, and books from the late 1800s and early 1900s because they are printed within the construct of the consciousness and the societal influences of the time, for better or worse. And so this one got my attention, and so I bought a copy of it off of eBay. And as I, I shared earlier, I, I happen to love grocery stores and, and shopping for groceries. I know that's a weird thing. You know, some people, they want to scale mountains, or they buy really expensive designer handbags, or they go on cruises. I love to go grocery shopping. <laughs> I have since I was a kid because I'm a foodie. And I just think it is wondrous that there are these enormous marketplaces where there is every kind of food. A amazing, right? <laughs> I'm sure that this is some sort of energetic ancestral carry over from the days when my very recent ancestors had nothing to eat. And now I think I can go to any grocery store and find anything I want. And I am so privileged and blessed to have the resources for the most part to purchase what I need. So it's fantastic. And I think I've shared this story with you before. When I first moved to Los Angeles, I wasn't making much money. I was in the entertainment industry and I was um, a little bit higher than entry level, but I, I really wasn't making much. And there was this very high-end grocery store across the street from where I worked called Gelson's. If you're from LA, you'll know Gelson's. And to me, Gelson's was paradise. They had the best and the finest of everything. And I would often go there on my lunch hour and I would see, it, it was always women, just I'm not trying to be um, sexist, but at the time, this would be the 80s, I would see the maids. And how did I know they were maids? Because they were wearing their uniforms. And they would be pushing a grocery cart and they would be carefully putting things into the cart. 
And one of the things that I would watch them buy was, at the time, cherries and grapes, the Gelson's variety, were $4 a pound, which was a lot of money back then. And I would watch them buy grapes and cherries at $4 a pound. And I thought, wow, that is something to aspire to, (laughs) that at some point I could buy things like cherries and grapes and not worry about how much they are. So I was always fascinated watching these women in maids' uniforms going around buying the most expensive groceries at Gelson's for their homes that they tended to in Beverly Hills. Like that whole archetype was alive and well in in the in the eighties. Think Dynasty, think Judith Krantz novels. Like all of those archetypes came from somewhere and, and so I was fascinated by watching these people shop for groceries when I I couldn't do that. But I mean, I could afford things, but you know, that was sort of aspirational for me. And I am grateful to say that I now live a life when I can buy grapes when I want them. And they are expensive these days. I no longer can eat cherries because I get a cherry stomach ache, but that's besides the point. I can buy other things that I love. And part of my entertainment during the week is to do my grocery shopping. And I go to quite a few different stores. I always have to go to Trader Joe's because Trader Joe's has things you can only get at Trader Joe's. And if I go to the Napa Trader Joe's, Then I also go to Whole Foods, which is right next door. And I never quite know what I'm going to get at Whole Foods. Sometimes they have really good pizza out by the slice, and if it's a kind of pizza I like, I might get a piece. I've shared with you before that at the the cheese station, which is fantastic, they do little odds and ends of cheeses that I always have to go through the basket to see if there's any cheese I might like because I love getting little bits of things. I'm a little bit kind of person. I want just a taste of something. I want like one serving of something. So I might go to Whole Foods. I do do some grocery shopping at Walmart. I know that that is an unpopular choice sometimes, but hey, I like a good bargain. And they also carry my cashew milk that I use for my smoothie and I can always find it there and my favorite kind of sourdough bread. So there's the Walmart experience. And depending on what's on sale, I might go to Safeway, which is one of our other grocery stores. And then I usually do a Costco run and I might do a Sam's run. See, everyone has something different. And if you don't like grocery shopping, this might sound horrific to you, but to me, it is lovely. Oh, and I go to Berkeley Bowl. How can I forget Berkeley Bowl? They have more kinds of produce than you've ever seen in your life. They have such great variety of food. So Berkeley Bowl I go to as well. Okay, so we've now established that I love grocery stores. When I was young, My mom, and even as my mom got older, my mother always preferred grocery stores with smaller footprints. She felt they were easier to shop at. And growing up in Skokie, there was a little corner grocery store called Linwood Market. It was on the corner of Tui and Crawford. And so I remember being in the cart, yes, as a kid, My mom would put me in the cart. I'm sure my sister must have been there somewhere as well. And push us around the store. And back in the day, you know, there were no scanners, right? This was, this was Fred Flintstone times. (laughs) Not really, but you know what I mean. And so some stock person, again, usually the the vernacular would be a stock boy, but I don't know that women, um, probably also did this as well. 
um, had a pricing gun and they would flip the numbers to whatever the price was and then they would stamp each of the cans. I was mesmerized by this because there was a rhythm. You know, if any of you are into the ASMR stuff, you know, the, the audio, the soothing audio sounds. Well, there was a rhythm to the way a pricing gun hit all the cans. It was like kerplunk, kerplunk, kerplunk. I thought this was fantastic. I loved that. And then the checkers would have to manually put in the prices and their fingers would fly across the register keys, which were manual. So it's like you put in 199 enter and you'd hear the tape go like there were all of these noises now now in grocery stores it's more like beep 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 which is not soothing versus click 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 <laughs> anyways i'm a little punchy can you tell so so my life is filled with grocery store memories because food is my love language and and i'm still mesmerized that some people don't care about food but that's a story for another day. And I realize many people don't have access to food, which is, again, so sad when we have such an abundance of food in this world that not everybody has access to it. So I realize that my perspective is one that comes with a lot of privilege. And so I am deeply grateful and humbled that this is my reality right now. So, so let's dive into the pages of the old grocery men. I haven't read this yet. I do not know what we're in for. But Mr. Roe Fulkerson is the author, and there's a picture of him, a photograph of him on one of the cover pages, and his hand is reaching out as if to shake your hand. So we'll start with a handshake from Mr. Fulkerson. So we start off with, Chapter 1, Starting Right I believe, said the drummer from the coffee house, that the grocery business is the hardest business in the world to make money out of. I know there are more failures in this line than any other, and I am sure I don't see why. And you know, as I'm reading this, I can't believe I left this out. My great-grandfather ran a grocery store in Chicago. And, and I don't think, don't think big grocery store. I think this was just a little neighborhood market. Um, the reason I know that he did is there is a Jewish German language newspaper that I found online that has an article about him getting in a fight with someone over a misunderstanding and it said that it happened in his grocery store. I didn't even know he had one. And then my other great grandfather in Denver, Colorado had a store, like a grocery store and also uh, I guess like a saloon, a bar kind of thing. Oh, I wish I knew all of these stories in, in more detail. But so it wasn't uncommon for choose to be the merchants, right? To have little stores where they sold things. So it's not unusual. But anyways, I come from people who ran corner stores. But back to the old grocery men. So they were just talking about how hard it is to make money as grocers. The old grocery man smiled and then replied, I agree with you as to the number of failures. The reason there are so many of these is the same reason that so many people fail as insurance and book agents. They take it up after they have failed at everything else. The one great law which makes or mars every business proposition is the law of supply and demand. And the grocer has all the best of it. Every living human must patronize some grocer. The question of which grocer is a matter 
which the grocer himself must decide. If he fails to get the business, the fault lies with him and not with the business. Any man in the grocery business who will follow well-established principles can make good. The real cause of failure can be traced in almost every instance to lack of system. This use of system must be introduced even before the store is rented. The average man who opens a grocery store buys the first one he sees for sale, instead of which he would better spend six months over the selection of a location. Every town and city in all the country has what the real estate operators term its crawl. The town is moving in some general direction. The business center and the residence center are slowly moving toward some one point of the compass, and the grocer who contemplates opening a store must be sure to locate in front of this crawl so that the town will be coming toward him rather than moving away. Having once determined this direction, he has settled the general location of his store, and he will have any one of a dozen places to choose from. And I do recognize this is all using the masculine gender, but that's a reflection of the time. There is only one way to determine the value of a location for any business house. The man who catches the most fish is the man who throws his bait into the creek where most of the fish are gathered. If you want to sell goods of any sort, the place to sell them is where most people congregate. To determine which is the best of any two locations, simply stand in front of each and count the number of people who pass each day. A store which is passed by a thousand daily is worth exactly twice as much rent as one passed by five hundred. We will leave out of consideration the matter of window decoration, fixtures, cleanliness, and all of those things which summed up mean good service and take it for granted that the store is what it should be, and not a bit less in that respect. And on each page, there's one or two drawings that are reflecting these principles. A grocery store, like a ringworm and a tariff question, is purely a local matter. A grocery can hope to attract trade only from a certain distance. The large proportion of people will not walk more than three blocks to a grocery. This gives the zone of possible customers three blocks away from the store, or 36 city blocks in all. These are the people with whom the grocer must do business. Again, this is the early 1900s, so most people do not have cars, and they are walking places. Now we begin to get busy with the system. Let the grocer take his best, brightest employee and for the first few years make an advertisement of him. A bright girl might do as well. Well, that's wonderful to know. <laughs> a bright girl might do as well. Let this clerk make a house-to-house -house canvas and a house-to-house -house census of those 36 blocks. Let him interview the buyer in every house, leave a business card, Tell the lady just what he is there for. Tell her that he has opened a good store and why it is good. Get the name and address. Find out where she has been buying, if she has a phone, and in fact all the information possible, and make a record of every bit of it. From this mass of information you will see exactly what you are up against in your fight for business. Make it all into a card index so that you can put your hand on the name and address of any person in this 36 blocks. Wow, that is ambitious and also speaks to the fact that people would be willing to have these conversations because nowadays, forget about it. But perhaps back then they were more open to it. And this also sounds like he's really talking about more urbanized areas because so many people lived like that. And so there would be apartment buildings and I would imagine these are densely populated areas. So that would be quite an undertaking. 
Okay, so let's return to what we're supposed to do next. So next, get the local credit agency to give you the credit. Wow, okay, this is, this is invasive now, maybe not then. Next, <laughs> get the local credit agency to give you the credit for each of these people so that, that if one of them desires to open a charge account, you can turn to your index and at once say yes or no. Wow. Okay. <laughs> the up-to-date farmer takes a small plot of ground and uses intensive cultivation. The modern advertiser concentrates his efforts in one locality in what is known as zone advertising. The grocer who concentrates his efforts on these 36 blocks is stealing the very heart out of these two splendid ideas. Those 36 blocks, well cared for, are better than a whole city poorly and sparsely cultivated. Thorough advertising done in this small zone is better than 10 times the money scattered over a whole city. Omitting generalities, there are a dozen ways this index card may be used to further the interests of the store. It is an ideal list to use in your advertising. Get out some form of advertising every month or get out of business. Ooh, that's harsh. Okay. All right. We will. Exclamation point. I'm sorry. It has an exclamation point there. Not me giving it an exclamation point. You had just as well try to drive a horse without feeding him as to attempt to run a store in this age without advertising. Right at the outset of any grocer's career, he might realize that his hope of success rests largely on his ability to hitch his little cart to the chariot of the great national advertisers. He must get in the rush and reap the benefit of the great advertising appropriations of these concerns. He should put their products in his stock and then sit down and write them a frank open letter telling them all about this card index of his and ask them for sample packages of their goods for distribution among these people. Sampling is the very best form of advertising. Write to every factory represented on the shelves of the store and get samples. Get literature with your own imprint on it. Get advertising matter of any sort and then earn it. The way to earn it to make it pay the grocer, to make it pay the manufacturer, is to see to it that these samples are properly distributed, not thrown in the gateway to be picked up by the neighbor's children, but each one properly addressed and delivered at the door by a neat boy. Get your name on these samples, wrap them in paper with your name on it, and seal them with a sticker containing your name, and then have the boy who delivers them Tell the people who sent it. Get your name so closely associated with that of the manufacturer that when people think of the goods, they will think of your name and come to your store to get them. It's interesting that this was published by Kellogg's, so you know that Kellogg's was promoting this kind of relationship with their grocers. All right, let's see what comes next. Have your delivery man make a record of every delivery he makes and check this up on your card index so you can see when people in the 36 blocks are not dealing with you. When you find a family is not dealing with you, go and ask them why. <laughs> that would go over really well today. Um, why are you not coming to Safeway anymore, Laurel? I would be horrified. I'd be like, go away. I'll never shop with you again. Tell them what good things you have to offer. Tell them how cheap, prompt, clean, and pretty your store is. And ask them just to come around and look it over. Wow, things have changed. All right. When your check on the index card from the delivery book shows that one of your families has just begun to deal with you, Sit down and write them a personal letter telling them that you have noticed it and appreciate their business. 
and thank them for it. And then tell them if at any time they notice anything in the world that you can do to improve the store service, you would thank them if they would let you personally know about it. Someday, when you have a special bargain, get out the lists of those people who have phones. It's interesting, they are spelling phones, apostrophe, P-H-O-N-E-S. So at the time, they must have had to draw attention to the fact that it was an abbreviation for telephone. So I just think that's interesting. Apostrophe, P-H-O-N-E-S. And call them up one by one and tell each what you have to offer. And ask if they would not like to have you send some around, subject to inspection and return, of course. Wow, can you imagine? Hi, Laurel. This is Berkeley Bull. We have some amazing Kyoho grapes. May we send some around and see if you like them? That would be awesome. Please do. <laughs> I guess it's called Instacart now, right? I, I mean, I would only imagine that we are living in a world that is George Jetson-like compared to what these grocery stores were like back then, right? You just you just put out a little request over the, you know, digital world and food is brought to you. And then they also track what we're buying, uh, right? For better or worse. All right. If you never sell five cents worth, it will yet pay you as will call attention to your store and to the fact that any person with a phone can order groceries from you over it. And the next rainy day, you will reap your reward. Get the manufacturers of foodstuffs to send their demonstrators to your store and write to your 36 blocks of customers that you will demonstrate jello in your store, that pies made out of none such mincemeat, I don't know what that is, but sounds interesting, will be made there, or that puddings made of Kingsford's cornstarch will be served. Some dairymen will furnish the cream that is needed for the ad. All of these things can be done at small expense, small trouble, and great profit. The greatest difficulty the national advertiser has is lack of cooperation on the part of the retailer. The grocer who shows the manufacturer of a food product that he is the greatest little cooperator who ever left Cooperatorsville. Okay, that's what it says, Cooperatorsville, and came to the wicked city, will find the manufacturer of most nationally advertised articles ready to help him to a finish. But above all things, let these matters be handled with system. Stick to that card index like a sick kitten to a hot brick. Nestle and hover over it even as a Dominecker hen nestleth and hovereth over her one lone bench legged gosling. Wow, that's some crazy writing. Go over it three times a week and inspect it from every angle like a monkey in the zoo, making an entomological examination of his cage mate. Wow, there's a lot of metaphor happening here. Work every family on those 36 blocks like a farmer with a five-acre plot of ground, and you will soon reap a generous harvest of dollars. All right, well, we now know the way to run a successful grocery store back in the early 1900s. Okay, chapter two. As to system, the old grocery man had been called in by his young fellow to look over his store, book, system, and accounts. And the two had gone deeply into the entire establishment and then lighted cigars to talk it over, because that's what men did back then. Okay, I said that, of course, that is not written here. You are too practical, said the old grocery man. You care too little for what you choose to call the red tape of business. System and red tape are two entirely different things. Red tape is system gone to seed, and that I will admit is as bad or worse than your method of guessing at things. 
You tell me that you wish to simplify your bookkeeping as far as possible, and I tell you that you have overdone it. There is one point in particular which I want to call your attention. Your stock and fixture account won't do. I see that for five years you have made an annual deduction of 10% for deterioration of fixtures. This is a fallacy common to many grocers. It is true without a doubt that the 10% loss is there, and I think it is perfectly right and proper for you to deduct it, but do so on a scratch pad for your own information. In case of fire or in case you should want to sell out, you want your fixtures charged up at the price it would cost you to get new ones. The insurance adjuster is going to settle with you on the basis of what you have in your book as to the actual value, not on basis of what it would cost you to buy new ones. Here is one of those cases where an article has two distinct values. This desk we are sitting at cost you $25. You have had it five years. You would have a hard time getting $15 for it from a second-hand man, but if this was burned, you had to buy a new one, it would cost you $25 again, so you must be ready for the insurance adjuster. In common with so many other businessmen, you seem to think that the accountant's method of distributing values on paper is of no consequence. It is only lately that such men as you stop to think how your actions for the good or ill of the establishment may be influenced by ready facts presented in an orderly way at a timely moment. I, I was just thinking to myself that this part is boring, but then I remembered it's a sleep podcast. So if you're bored now, this is a good time to go to sleep because <laughs> I think it's going to stay boring for a little while because we're talking about accounting. Unless you find accounting to be riveting, some people would. Okay, for example, I have a set of charts of my sales for many years, which money could not buy me. Did you ever see a fever chart in a sick room? There's no better way of keeping sales in a form where they can be seen at a glance than the principle used in this fever chart. So take a card and rule it with 31 vertical columns, and then put in as many horizontal columns as you are likely to take in dollars in a day. If your business is one where the daily sales run into hundreds, then use $5 as a column unit. Rule one such chart for every month in the year, making 12 in all. At the end of the month, take a pen with red ink and rule on this chart a line representing the rise and fall of your business in dollars, just as the nurse rules the line representing the rise and fall of the fever in degrees. A single glance at the chart will show the tendency of the business. Do not make a second set of charts for the next year, but use the same ones, only ruling with a different color of ink. In five years, you will have a record which, at a glance, will tell you what an hour's hunt through your books would not reveal. A sudden slump in sales does not seem so bad when your chart shows you that you had the same slump on the same month For the last five years, vacations, advertising appropriations, and half hundred other things in your store may be regulated by a glance at this chart. See, this was in the days before Excel. Excel is is wonderful now that you think about having to do it this way. Another thing I have noticed in your store is the fact that you have only the selling price marked on your package and canned goods. You tell me that you have not taken stock for two years. These two facts are hooked together like a yoke of oxen. You have not taken stock because it is too much trouble, and it is too much trouble because you haven't marked the cost on your packages. Never, under any circumstances, mark your goods with a secret selling price. The best way on earth to avoid the unpleasantness of having your customers try to get you to sell goods at a lower price than the one you asked is by having those goods marked in plain figures. The one price house is the only one which wins, and the first move of the one price house is to mark all goods with a selling price in plain figures. 
Your cost price may be, in fact, must be a secret one. And there are a dozen methods of handling this. The time-honored one is to take some word with 10 different letters in it, like the word Republican, and allow each letter to stand as a symbol for one of the 10 figures. This method is easy of detection for the curious, however. The next system is by confusing numerals. Of this, the simplest form is to add an extra figure to each end of the cost, thus marking an article which cost 25 cents, 3257. But this mental process of eliminating the first and last figures in the number becomes so much a matter of habit that it will be carried into other calculations till mental arithmetic becomes almost impossible for the user of a figure symbol cost mark. Well, that's, that's interesting. Okay, the, the next mo the, oh, here we go. The most satisfactory system I have ever used is one where the cost of the article is indicated in the ornamental border of the price tag. Interesting. Have some gummed stickers and string tags printed with a border of small circles, printed in the general form of a square. In the center of the square, on the blank piece, put your selling price in plain figures. The cost is marked by a small tick mark in one of the circles in the tag border. Let each side of the square contain 10 of the small circles, and each circle represents one of the 10 digits, an article costing $3.75 and selling for $5.00 would have the $5 selling price marked in the center, and the tick is the third circle of the top row, the seventh circle in the right-hand row, and the fifth circle in the bottom row. This is based on taking the upper left-hand corner as a starting point, but of course any other corner could be used as a starting point, and the system could work just as well from right to left. Wow, I would have never thought that that could be an issue. That's interesting. I mean, interesting being relative, right? Because it's a sleep podcast. I don't mean like this is riveting stuff. I'm just interested. <laughs> I use these same gummed stickers for another purpose. When a price is made to me, I put the price in plain figures at the center of the tag and mark the discount in the border and paste them in a book with the name of the firm making the quotation at the head of the sheet. This has saved me several discounts and has confused several salesmen. Now these things I have mentioned seem to be the principal things wrong with your system. If you hope to be able to tell what you are doing, you must take stock at least twice a year. With such labels as I have suggested, stock-taking is easy. Entirely outside of the satisfaction of knowing how much a grocer has made, stock-taking serves as a check on the worst danger he has to contend with. There is a great tendency to allow all of one's profits to become invested in shop-worn, unseasonable stock. The regular taking of stock Will enable you to get this stuff down off your shelves and onto your bargain tables. After you've seen a few hundred dollars wasted by selling stuff from your bargain table at a discount, you will be more careful about overstocking to get an extra discount or overbuying to get an extra case, and will stick more closely to those well advertised goods which do not stick on your shelves and which are sold at the same price for a case or a carload, and so can be bought in small quantities and served to your trade in perfectly fresh condition. Well, so we are only two chapters in. So if we have to time travel back to 1913, we will have some ideas on how to set up a successful grocery store. And, and we will be advocates of change and we will be grocery women or grocery men or grocery people. <laughs> and isn't that amazing that they're teaching them to canvas the whole neighborhood and go door to door and then get their credit? 
I, I can't even believe that that would be available. But of course it was back then. And the credit always belonged to the men. Women couldn't have their own credit back then, I don't think. I mean, I think it wasn't until the 70s that women could open their own charge cards or something like that. So anyway, so I always find this interesting. These are like little um, time capsules, right? Of what life was like then and what could be expected. And I would imagine this kind of book would be helpful if somebody was running a grocery store and was trying to learn some of the best systems. So, all right, here's to the old grocery men and Kellogg's and the author, Mr. Rowe, I think, what was it, Fulkerson? Okay, sorry if I got his, no his name wrong. Hold on, I'll look it up again. I should know. I should know how to pronounce his name. Mr. Rowe Frokerson. Easy for me to say. All right, well, I wish you dreams of wonderful groceries that delight you and that you get on sale with coupons. <laughs> and I wish you the sweetest of dreams, and I am so profoundly grateful for you. So we'll talk again soon. Thank you.